Good morning, church family and friends. For those of you that may be joining us for the first time, my name is Angel Gomez. I serve as the associate pastor here at Calvary Presbyterian Church, and we are glad that you've decided to join us. We always begin our worship services with a call to worship, and a call to worship is meant to urge us to turn from the things of this world. And maybe those things are things like that, that would cause us fear. Sometimes those things are what causes us anxiety. And so the call to worship is meant to urge you to turn from those things and to, and to, to, to focus your gaze upon the Lord. Just as David writes, Psalm 27, verses 1 through 6, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, when adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. It's, it's as if God himself is, is, is taking those of us, so many of us, who are downcasted with our heads down, and he puts his hand just, just under our chin and gently just raises our head up. And then we do what it says at the very end, to sing and make melody to the Lord. So let us now worship the Lord in song. Oh my 
Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty Father, your glory has been revealed to us in the person and work of your Son, Jesus, who is our Savior and our Lord. And, and just as we just sang, we wait upon Him. We wait for His return. We long to see Him. We worship and serve Him this day as we wait. Father, by Your Holy Spirit, change us this day. Transform us. Make us more like Him, more like Jesus. May our prayers, may the music this morning, may the praises of your people and the preaching of your holy word be pleasing in your sight. May this worship be in spirit and in truth. For the sake and in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now let us join together in singing the Gloria Patri. This has been something that has been sung since the earliest days of the New Testament church. Our scripture reading this morning is a story about a boat. It's a historic account that the Lord himself gives us, and it shows us the sovereign power of God over all things, including those things that may cause us to fear. I'll be reading from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, and hear this, the very word of God himself. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, him, they took him with them in a boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Brothers and sisters, let us consider that. Let us consider the power of God and our own fears, our own anxieties. Let us now, as is our tradition and custom, to, to come before him now in a time of confession as individuals, confessing our sins acknowledging his sovereign power over all things. And then we'll come together as one body in one voice, confessing corporately.
Brothers and sisters, will you confess with me the words that are taken here from Psalm 30? Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear our voices. Let your ears be attentive to the cries for mercy. For if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. Therefore, we wait for you alone, and in your word we put our hope. Have compassion on us, O Lord, as you have promised, and swallow up the multitude of our sins in the infinite sea of your mercy. Give to us in Jesus, given to us in Jesus Christ, your only Son, and by the power of his precious blood, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. And hear these, this word of encouragement, of, 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 of assurance that we get from the Apostle Paul as he's writing to, the, to, to another teacher, uh, Titus, in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is the hope we have, and that is the hope that leads us to respond in song, thanking him for mercy. Our confession of faith this morning serves as a good summary of what the Bible teaches regarding the person and work of Jesus. The price that was paid in order to purchase our redemption. So, 
people of God, wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the, the power of death for a time. Wherein consisteth <clears throat> Christ's exaltation? Christ's exaltation consisteth in the rising again from the dead on the third day, in ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Praise be to God. Let us now enter a time in which we offer a prayer of petition before the Lord. And so would you please join me as we go before the throne of grace. O oh Lord our God, we come to you as your sons and daughters, your servants, grateful for the redemption that is ours in Jesus Christ, and yet aware of our continuing <clears throat> need of your grace. We need your grace as individuals, as households, as families, as a church, as a nation, and as a world. <clears throat> your word tells us that prayers, intercessions, supplications, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Praying for all people. We pray for all those who govern. We pray for all who rule, not just that we would live quiet and, and peaceable lives, but we ask that you would have mercy upon them. We desire that they would be saved and come to a saving knowledge of you. We thank you for your church. This large gathering of sinners that you have gathered, saved by your grace, called to care for one another. During this time of pandemic, Father, will you open a door for your word to be let out of this, to this generation? This world is subject to futility and there are so many who are lost. Father, would you use your church to bring the good news to those without hope? We pray for that around the world, and we pray that especially for our own region here. Willow Grove, Abington, Philadelphia. Father, use the people of Calvary, this place where our name says, Jesus is lifted up. Whether it means sending or being sent, use us. We pray for the leaders of this church, the elders, the deacons, our church staff, leading, serving, and driving our mission forward. We ask for a clear vision, godly character, competency, teachable spirits. And this mission won't be the mission of solely the leaders, but of everyone. There are many who are sick in our midst. For some it is chronic. And Father, for them we ask that you would make your presence apparent to them. We pray the same for those who are in mourning. Will you fill them with your spirit, the spirit which comforts, the spirit which strengthens. Thank you for the model so many of them are to us as they live as people not without hope. Father, we thank you for the mercy you have had upon several 
in their recovery from illness in our church. We pray your, your healing provision continues. We see this, this healing, we see this relief from pain, the recovery of our bodies, and it, it reminds us of a kingdom to come. A kingdom where there will be no sickness, no pain, no tears, no death. You are the God who has conquered death. You are our God. You have overcome this world and all its pandemics and all its fear and all of its anxiety and all of its sin and death. You have overcome it and we hope and rest in that. We know that. We trust that. We hope and rest and pray in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Amen. Now let us hear the word of the Lord preached. Good morning and welcome to this week's installment of Pastor John preaching in your living room. Uh, it is good to come to you today and to look at the word of the Lord together. Uh, I, I continue to have you all on my heart and pray that you're well. So thank you for, for joining for, for worship this morning, whether you're a part of Calvary Church or you're looking in from the outside of our church family. I'm, I'm so grateful for everyone who is listening to this message today. Uh, we have been looking at Psalm 107. It's a beautiful psalm about God's steadfast love to us and, and saving us from all sorts of different situations. And so this is our third week in Psalm 107. Uh, the first week we considered God's love for those who wander. Last week we looked at God's love for those who were rebellious and foolish. Uh, and this week we, we have a section of this psalm that talks about God's love in saving those who are caught in the grips of fear as they are caught out in a storm at sea. And so let me read for us Psalm 107, verses 23 through 32. Hear now the word of our God. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up, the, up to heaven. They were brought down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Would you pray with me? Lord, we do, even now, give you thanks for your steadfast love, for your wondrous works to us in saving us through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus. And we pray as we, uh, as we continue um, in this world, as, as those who are guided by your word and spirit, that you would use this passage of scripture in our hearts and in our lives uh, to help us and give us strength as we continue in a time that is very much like a storm surrounding us. So be with us, Lord, as we consider this word in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So as I read the words of Psalm 107 that we just heard, you know, I can't help but reflect on the fact that the coming of this coronavirus and this whole pandemic has very much been like a great storm that has overtaken us, hasn't it? Uh, you know, I remember well the, the day of Sunday, March 8th, which was the very last normal worship service that we had at Calvary in this building together. Uh, of course, by that point, we had been hearing reports for some time that there was, that this thing was coming to us and that it was going to be a really big problem for us. But of course, uh, what, what awaited us in the coming weeks and months, none of us had any idea what was about to come. Uh, and those reports that we were hearing were sort of like the dark clouds out in the distance, uh, that we saw it approaching, but we weren't sure exactly exactly what would happen when we were in the middle of it. 
the day before March 8th, that, that Saturday before that, I, I remember hearing uh, about the first cases in Bucks County. Uh, and so all of a sudden it started to get real, right? And I went to the store and I was going to stockpile uh, hand sanitizers for us to put around the, the church here. And uh, of course I get to the store and what, what do I find? All of the hand sanitizer, all of the soap, everything, you know, the toilet paper, everything wiped out. And it's like, okay, what, what, what's the deal? What are, what are we really looking to here? And um, so I come back here I, I, and I run around the, the church property and gather together all the hand sanitizer that I could find. Actually, we had a lot more than I thought we had uh, and, and put it around the building here and we had the worship service. It was a palpable sense of, of um, uncertainty for us that morning. We didn't know what, 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 what awaited and after the service, I remember many people coming up to me and saying, did you hear? We now have the first cases in Montgomery County, not just Bucks County. And then, of course, uh, the storm started to overtake us and from that point on it was just like wave after wave after wave and now here we are two and a half months later and the storm still very much surrounds us and it has completely changed our world. Uh, and so as we consider Psalm 107 this morning what we see here really is is God's purpose in the storm both in allowing the storm to overtake us, both in bringing the storm in the first place and in stilling it in the end. And so three things for us to consider this morning. The storm, the stilling, and the steadfast love. The storm, the stilling, and the steadfast love. First, the storm. Verses 23 through 25 once again. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. Uh, and so here's basically a group of people who are doing what? They're just going about their regular business. They decide to go out on the sea to, to maybe they're merchants or something like that, and, and they're just going about what, what, what they had planned, and then the storm comes, right? And this is very much the way life so often is, isn't it? We just sort of float through, we're going about our regular routines, and all of a sudden something overtakes us and everything changes. Now I want you to note well uh, where we've come in this psalm. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we have come from those who wandered in the desert, right, uh, two weeks ago, to now out in the middle of the ocean, out in the middle of the sea. So from, from, from no water at all to, 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 to about to die of thirst, then to far too much water. Right now we have this storm in the middle of the sea. Psalm 107, you see, really covers a whole range of human suffering. So we started out in the desert, then we went down into the dungeon in chains and darkness, uh, and then we were on, on a sick bed, uh, the, those who were suffering affliction, and now here out in the middle of the ocean. really gives a picture of God, the God of the Bible, that stands in direct contrast to the various gods of the world in which this psalm was written, the ancient Near Eastern world, right? Because the gods of the nations of the ancient Near East, they were, they were over all sorts of different aspects of creation. So you had, you know, you had a god for the sun, you had, the, you had a god for the harvest, you had a god for the storm, you had a god for the sea, you had a god for the underworld, all these sorts of things, right? But the message of Scripture is that the true and living God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the God over all things, from the highest heights to the deepest depths. Every single aspect of His creation is in the palm of His hand. There is not a single part of the the world that the one true God does not hold sway over. He is much different than the gods of the nations. And so, don't miss this, right? In Psalm 107, who is it that brings the storm? It is the Lord who brings the storm according to this psalm. It couldn't be, couldn't be more clear, could it? Uh, he both brings the storm and he is the one who stills the storm. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind. Uh, you see, we have been called throughout this psalm to praise God for what? For his, 
his wondrous works to the children of man. And so what does it see here? They say here, they saw his wondrous works. And what is that wondrous work? The first aspect of that wondrous work that these people out at sea in Psalm 107 see is the storm that he brings. Uh, and here... And so think about uh, this theme of the storm throughout Scripture, right? Uh, in the Old Testament, we really have two great, uh, great events of judgment and salvation. First, the flood, right? And so God brings all of this water upon the earth, but he saves Noah and his family through that judgment and brings them safely on the other side. Then also, in the exodus of Israel out of Egypt, again, we have the whole theme of water coming into play because how is the exodus completed? It is completed as God brings the people of Israel safely over the Red Sea on dry ground, but he crushes the army of Egypt, brings judgment upon Pharaoh and his army at, in those very same waters through which he brought his people. Uh, and so these two great acts of judgment centered on this theme of, of water, of God's great power seen in his control over the waters. Think too about Jonah, the prophet Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, what happens? Jonah gets on the ship, right, to, to, to flee from, from the presence of the Lord, uh, to go from Joppa to Tarshish. Uh, and just like in, in Psalm 107, what happens? It is the Lord who brings this storm to overtake this ship that Jonah gets on. And, but also, just, just like in Psalm 107, the people on that ship in Jonah chapter 1, they, what happens? They cry out to the Lord to save them. They throw Jonah overboard, uh, and then the, the Lord calms the, the wind and the sea, and then just like in Psalm 107, they worship and give thanks to the Lord. So a lot of interesting parallels there with Jonah chapter 1. And so Psalm 107, the Lord is the one who commands this storm that overtakes these men out at sea, right? And verse 26 says, they mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths. So you get this picture of these huge waves, right, that are, that are carrying this ship up to the sky and then dropping it down. Uh, last week, I, I saw a video of a ship out on the Indian Ocean uh, in the middle of a, of a storm with these huge waves. Google or uh, go on YouTube and, and type in ship in Indian Ocean storm and it'll come up. It's just mesmerizing and also terrifying. I sort of got seasick just watching this thing, right? Uh, and that's, it'll sort of give you a picture of the sort of thing that, that Psalm 107 is talking about, w going up to the heavens and then being brought down to the depths. And so what happens? Well, of course, for these men, fear and despair start to set in. Uh, their it says their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. You know, through this whole crisis that we are in, this is sort of the way it has felt for many of us, isn't it? Uh, being dr like we're being dropped again and again. Of course, on the large scale, we, we, we see happening out there, out in the distance, the various waves uh, and of uh, various sizes, you know, out there in the world. But then in our own lives, crashing into us, there are the waves that have really hit home for us and, and, and our church family. School years, uh, graduations, celebrations, jobs, people that we love, carried away by this terrible, terrible storm. And our hearts have been tossed around on the waves, and anxiety and fear and despair have started to, to creep in, reeling and staggering around like the picture that we have here, trying to get our footing. We grab a hold on something, and then all of a sudden the next wave comes, and we're knocked back. Uh, when all this started, I confess, I sort of fit this picture, right, of these, these people reeling and staggering around, you know, up in my bedroom in, in quarantine with, with the flu as all of these things are starting to develop, develop around us, you know, wondering, what do I do? What do we do? How do I lead? How do I shepherd? How do we stay together in this, right? How do we strengthen one another? What is going to happen to the ship? Uh, will the ship hold? And thanks be to God, dear friends. Uh, both for, and, and, and thanks be to God, both for me and for all of you, that I am not the captain of this ship. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the captain of the ship. Amen. And because of that, 
the ship will hold. He sees us through the storm. And one thing that's happened to me through all of this is that it has brought me personally uh, to a place where I have been forced to remember that, that Jesus Christ is our hope uh, again and again and again every single day and to trust in him and to cry out. And no, uh, it has not been a comfortable place to be, but it has been a very good place to be uh, because it points us to the one who is our only comfort in life and in death, as Heidelberg Catechism puts it. And so then, after the storm comes the stillness. Verse 28, just like those before in, in the previous three groups of people, so here it says they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. You see, uh, if, here's the thing, if we are going to seek God amidst the things that we fear, if we are going to trust in the Lord in the storm, if we are going to, if we are going to hold fast to him, then what needs to happen? We need to let go and relinquish control. We need to let go and relinquish control. It's like we're, we're floating out at sea, right? And, all of the, and there's all this debris and we're trying to grab it and we're trying to grab it and enough, nothing works and nothing helps, but God is there with, with, a, with an outstretched arm and his face is gazing upon us through the clouds and he just wants us to reach out to him, to cry out to him. And in order to do that, what needs to happen? We need to get our eyes off of the sea and off of all the debris that is around us and lift them up to our God who sits enthroned in the heavens. Uh, indeed, we need to be freed from the lie that we were ever actually in control in the first place. And, and indeed, that is, that is not a very easy thing to do, right? Because I don't know about you, but I really want to be the one in control. I really want, I want to be in control. And see, here's the irony for me. Uh, and I would suggest for all of us, it is, it is my very desire for control that causes me to fear, right? Because, why? Because I know deep down, even as I'm grasping for control of things in my own life, I know deep down that I really don't have any control. Uh, and therefore, I fear because I know that I can't get a grip on anything, but I need to but look to the God who already has a grip on me, dear friends, and, and so, so do you. Um, and see, this is the one thing that God is doing when he brings these storms into our lives that we can't do anything about. He is bringing you and me to a place where we will come to realize that ultimately we are not in control so that we will see that he is the one who is. Many of you may have heard it said before, uh, that old cliche, God won't give you anything more than you can handle. I'm here standing in front of this camera this morning to tell you that that is a lie. That is a lie. It is a lie that God won't give you any more than you can handle. Look at what it says in Psalm 107. Their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Seems like the storm was something that they couldn't handle, right? Then what? They put their heads down and muscled through and got, to the, got safely, safely through the storm? No. If that's what they did, then they stood no chance, right? No, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. The storm was more than they could handle. You see, God will bring things into our lives that we can't handle. The truth is that He won't bring anything into your life that He can't handle. He won't bring anything into your life that He can't handle, and His purpose in bringing these sorts of things into our lives is that we would, we would cry out to Him and that we would trust in Him and that he, he, would, he would draw us closer and closer to Himself. And so, beloved, when you see the clouds and you feel the wind and you're being pelted with the waves, what do you do? You look up uh, with eyes that are filled with tears by faith to the one who is there 
to help you. And you reach out with a trembling hand of faith to lay hold of the one who is with you in the storm. And you call upon him. For just as the power of God is seen in bringing the storm, so also it is seen and seen all the more in stilling the storm. Verses 29 through 32, it says, He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed, and they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. So the, the storm is stilled, the waves of the sea are hushed, and not only that, but notice, and note this well, just as the Lord brought the storm in the first place, so now it is the Lord who brings them safely to their desired haven. He is the God of the storm, but he is also the God of the calm and the, and the peace and the rest. And this is where I want to bring to, into focus for us the earlier reading that we had from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, who, who is the Lord of the storm? The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of the storm. Mark chapter 4. They go out to sea. And why do they go out to sea? Because Jesus told them to, right? At the command of Jesus himself. Mark 4.35, 4 Jesus says, let us go to the other side of the sea. And so, beloved, Jesus knows everything, right? Jesus knows all things. He knows what is waiting for them on the sea is the storm. And yet, he, d he leads his disciples directly into this storm. And what does he do? He falls asleep. <laughs> Mark 4, 37 through 38. A great, a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Uh, and so just like Jonah... In Jonah chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus is asleep in the boat amidst this storm, but very much unlike Jonah, Jesus wakes up, and what does he do? Rather than getting, getting thrown overboard, Jesus merely speaks the word, and the wind and the sea and the storm ceases. At the mere utterance of his voice, the wind and the sea obey him. Verse 39, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace, be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Psalm 107, he made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. So here's the thing. Why? Why did Jesus bring them into the storm, and then let them fear, and then only after that calm the storm? It was so that they might see that he is the one with power over the wind and the sea. He is the God of the storm. He is the Savior Lord of Psalm 107. Come into the boat with them. And so they very appropriately say there in Mark 4, don't they, who is this? <laughs> who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. In other words, this is somebody unlike anyone we've ever known or seen or heard of before. This is something, something altogether different. He is a prophet, but he is so, so much more than a prophet. He is the one who calms the sea. Come into the boat with us. And so you see, why do, why do you and I as his disciples now living in the world 21st century Willow Grove, Pennsylvania or wherever you are this morning, why do we go through these sorts of storms in our lives? Uh, why, why does it happen? It is because, beloved, listen to me. It is because the single most important thing in your life for you and for me is not our temporary earthly comfort it is that we would see and love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the most, single most important thing that happens in our lives. And as we float through life, we are lulled to sleep. Uh, and, 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 and we will not see Him clearly if, if we're just floating through. We need to see Him and cry out to Him and trust in His steadfast love for us amidst the storm. Which brings us then to the last point, the steadfast love. Here's what I want you to know today, beloved. 
For those who have the Lord Jesus Christ with us in the storm, there is a stillness. There is a stillness and a calm for you right now, even amidst the storms that come crashing down upon you, even amidst this present storm that we are right now in, this tumultuous storm of crisis and pandemic that has overtaken our world. On the night just before that man who calmed the sea gave his own life, he said to his disciples these words, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. To be sure, for his disciples, the storms were coming. He told them it. Uh, he, he, he would go on to say, in this world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He get, he, the, the storm comes, but even so, he gives peace. He gives peace. Through the wind and the sea, beloved, do you hear today? Do you hear today his voice echoing from the heavens through the wind and the sea and through the clouds of this life, speaking into the tumultuous sea of your own heart? Peace. Be still. Peace. Be still. Peace. Be still. You see, dear friends, as we are tossed by the waves on the deep waters of life's trials and sorrows and sufferings, we must never forget that there is another deep. There is another deep, a much deeper deep a fathomless and inexhaustible deep that never failingly answers to the depths of this life that come crashing down upon us, the steadfast love that God has spoken to us in his great and precious promises is the deep that calls out in response to the depth of our suffering and will swallow it up soon enough. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century English preacher, put it this way, he said, great, de great deeps of trial bring with them great deeps of promise. For you, much afflicted ones, there are words great and mighty which are not meant for saints of easier experience. For you, much afflicted ones, there are words great and mighty that are not meant for saints of easier experience. And precious flock, know this. That inexhaustible deep that is in the Lord Jesus Christ has been sealed for you for all time in his own precious blood. For he himself, our Lord Jesus, is the one who came down into the raging sea of this world, the God of the storm, come to take our place in the storm. For the very one who calmed the wind and the sea with the mere utterance of his voice, there came a storm upon him. A storm the likes of which, thanks be to God, those who trust in him will never face. The storm of God's judgment against our sins that came crashing down on him that you and I might be saved. A storm that no one in this world no one who has ever lived could ever possibly withstand a storm that caused his own disciples to scatter just seeing it in the far off distance. But Jesus would remain alone in that storm. God of the storm come into the storm for us as one of us. And in that storm, you see, rather than a wooden ship, the only vessel that would be given to our Lord Jesus Christ was a wooden cross and he would be fixed to that cross and that cross would take him down to the depths and on that vessel of the cross he took our place he took our place as the one who was in the words of Psalm 107 mounted up to the heavens and brought down to the depths as he was lifted up on the cross and buried in the grave. For that is why he came. 
<laughs> That's why he came, to be God's steadfast love for you and me in the storm, because we were all of us perishing at sea, but God sent his word to come and to take our place there that we may be saved. And now for us, that same cross on which our Jesus was taken down to the depths, that very same cross has become for us a life raft to safety. So cling to that cross today, beloved. Cling to that cross, for it is a raft that carries you through the storms of this life, indeed through the very judgment of God to the rest of our desired haven, to that place that place, the new heavens and the new earth of which we read in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, and the sea was no more. What does that mean? No more storm. No more wind and waves crashing down upon us to overtake us and cause us to fear. And so, beloved, today, cling to the life raft of the cross amidst the storm and call upon those around you, too, to join you there, for th that cross is the only vessel, is the one and only unsinkable ship on which are writ large in bold letters in his own precious blood, the very blood of the word in our flesh, peace, be still, I am with you in the storm, peace, be still. And today, in response to those words that he has already spoken to you, let all of us together give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, our hearts are like that tumultuous sea. I acknowledge and I confess it and I bring it to you. Uh, still the sea, still the waves that rage within us, that bring so many uh, thoughts of despair and feelings of worry and anxiety and fear. Help us to cling to you through this. Give us the grace, O Lord, for you are already the one who has clung to us forever in Jesus. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And so, O oh Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We pray that you would cause the storms of this present age to cease. We, we pray that you would bring peace to our land. We pray that you would bring healing. We pray that you would bring that you would take the coronavirus from us. But even more than that, Lord, would you bring us, your people, and, and our neighbors with us to the foot of your cross, that we might see there the only one who can, who can still the raging of the sea. Help us to hear your voice today, O Lord, and that we might be still and know that you are God, and that you will be exalted among the nations. You will be exalted in the earth. Expand your kingdom and bring your righteous reign into our world, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the sake of his glory. Amen.
Now, people of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give to you his abundant peace. And may you be still and know today that he is God. Amen.